All right, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody, depending on where you are joining us from. And welcome to Core Online. My name is Tomei Bajweiler, and I will be your co-host today for this webinar, Store, Render, and Automate. And with me today, Steve Britnell, who is connecting from the UK. Uh, hi there. Yeah. So I'm basic, I've basically been working in, um, as a, a quick introduction of me anyway, I've been working in the post-production industry for about 24 years. Uh, 14 of them have been um, working for uh, manufacturers and about 10 of it in post-production. So I've kind of got a bit of an overview of both sides of the fence, which is probably one of the reasons why I'm here today. And I've also worked in post-production and Steve and I have been working together for several years at Film Nights in London. And together, we advise both facilities on how to optimize their pipelines built around Bezlight. Um, I actually learned a lot from you, Steve. It's quite nice to know. <laughs> and now that uh, I work as a workflow consultant in Toronto in Canada, we are still collaborating together, but we are now doing it remotely. Yeah, uh, indeed. And uh, over the last few years, post-production uh, landscape has changed beyond recognition. Uh, you know, delivering of UHD, HDR um, material has, has become the norm. And, you know, storage and rendering uh, and the need for it is growing exponentially. Uh, so Filmlight and post-production both need to adapt to this. And Filmlight has been developing new strategies for storage, rendering and automation. And today, Steve and I would like to showcase those new, uh, showcase to use those new strategies. We will give you an update on the Flux Store. We will introduce a new Bezat render and also the Filmlight API, including three examples of its integrations. Yeah, yeah. we've um, demonstrated some of the new tools and uh, answer your questions uh, after section two uh, in the Q&A and after section three. Um, so the first two are storage render and the second two is FL API. Um, also, all the products and tools that we're going to talk about today and demonstrate today are available today. Um, they've been uh, installed and running in post-production now for um, most of them since the start, well, for the, since the start of the year. Um, if you have any other questions at all during the webinar, please use the panel on your right-hand side to input a question and our admin person will forward them questions to us during the, uh, during the uh, webinar. Um, and please focus on the presentation content if that's possible. Uh, if it's not, then please contact myself or Toma direct uh, after the webinar and we can always answer those questions. And also we would like to ask you guys three questions today. And the first one should appear on your screen now uh, in the form of a poll. So we would like to know how full your storage is on average. And even if you are not a system administrator or a technical director, please feel free to reply. If you are working uh, off a storage as a colorist or an assistant, for example, because you have a feedback to give as well, of course. And if you do not want to answer, it's all fine. The poll will disappear anyway in a few seconds. Now, I also would like to remind people that the webinar will be recorded and it will be made available as soon as possible after for replay or also to forward it on. Um, well, I think it's uh, time for us to get started then. Perfect. Okay, great. So um, really to set the scene and uh, before we start into the detail of the webinar, I really want to give you a, a bit of a real world scenario. Um, which happened to me quite a few times during my time in uh, working for post-production facilities. So uh, the scenario is you you have a session, um, client is in the room or is about to enter the room, your timeline is prepped, your uh, display, your timeline cache is rendered and everything works. Uh, then the change comes. Uh, you know, the um, recon form, uh, different elements are needed to be inserted or VFX versions need to change. Um, I mean, this is quite a, a common occurrence. So um, you jump to it, you uh, associate all that new media, you link it to your timeline, you do the recon form, and then none of it plays back. Uh, the client is now in the room or, you know, is literally just about to enter the room. So 
you know, in this scenario, what do you do? Well, you consult possibly with your technical staff. Uh, this is where I used to come in to play during my time in the post houses. And you try and pick apart that that structure, that, that pipeline and work out what's going on. Well, um, you know, the media is on a centralized server. Is it the server? Is it the interconnect to the base light? You know, that fiber channel or the, um, uh, the high speed ethernet? Um, is it the base light? Um, so the engineer or the sysadmin tries to pick this problem apart and quickly realize that the media is 16 bit um, uncompressed EXRs. It's about 1.2 gigabytes of data per second to then try and get across from that centralized server to your baseline. So then the baseline can process them files. Um, I think this is quite a common occurrence. You know, it's a, it's a creative um, process we're involved in. Change is constant, um, but we still have the deadlines and we still have the clients in the room. So, you know, to try and allocate from a facilities point of view or from an engineering point of view enough uh, capacity and streaming bandwidth um, to uh, basically allow this to happen in real time is completely unrealistic. Um, you'd need uh, possibly the GDP of a small country to be able to allocate enough capacity and bandwidth. So, I mean, that's for me is the key to the crux of this particular problem is, you know, the constant change and the constant high demands on our infrastructure that we cannot allocate enough at one time. So with that scenario in mind, I'm going to um, now turn off my camera. I'm going to uh, start with my slides. And then um, I'll see you in a little while. On to my first slide. So, um, you know, that kind of introduction. So that my main role is to give you an introductory overview of the storage and rendering. Uh, and I think you'll be pleased to know it's not a lecture on file system tools on network infrastructure, like you can see in front of me. Um, we can save the acronyms for the next in the series. But if anybody would like more low level detail, um, then please uh, ask the question at the Q&A after section two, or again, simply just contact me or Tom. Um, so what are the demands to overcome? Well, we've just touched on them, but what about the detail? Um, that large camera formats, the high frame rates, the multi-element timelines all go together to push the demands of post-production storage in both terms of uh, capacity and streaming bandwidth and add into the mix uh, the need to access all of these elements during the, um, during the whole process. So from a TV series point of view, you have 10 episodes. All of those episodes, which are probably these days gonna be UHD, HDR material, all have to be online, all have to be accessible throughout the entire grade, not just episode one, all the way through to 10. So with that in mind, Filmlight had to adapt. We developed the Baselight Cloud. So from the slide, you can see we developed tools uh, for multi-threaded read and write, multi-threaded network access uh, with multi-link um, access. Um, this is the Baselight Cloud. It's Baselight to Baselight system network access. Uh, along with this, we also developed a Baselight system cache, which gives you a local render of display or timeline uh, again, to overcome these demands of that constant access of the centralized server. So, but along with Filmlight adapting, post houses have adapted as well um, to the demands of storage by using centralized SANs with fiber channel and lately uh, GPFS clustered systems with high speed Ethernet, which service the facility and most or all of the creative departments. But with the increasing cost and the complexity of storage, we developed Fluxstore. It's not trying to compete with the large centralized storage devices, but it is just being built for one purpose, to stream the high resolution image sequences. Um, Fluxstore fits into the base like cloud to support the cloud and offload those high bandwidth demands of color grading, as you can see from that slide. Um, the read, the write, the high resolution image sequences. Uh, from that centralized service. Um, with the tried and tested file system tools and network protocols we have been using on Baselight for over 15 years. This is why Fluxstar only has to use 
um, high capacity spinning disks uh, and not the solid state SSDs or NVMe uh, cards, uh, which traditionally are quite low volume and high cost and in certain cases quite hard to implement. Um, also off the shelf Ethernet networking that any system admin can configure. So think of Fluxdoor, looking at that slide in front of you as a high capacity, low cost NAS with SAN streaming or GPFS cluster streaming capabilities over 100 gigabit Ethernet. All of this goes together to help with the problems with color grading on post-production storage. So with that said, now onto the range. So the range of the flux stores that we're talking about today, as you can see from the left working to the right, we have the 240 terabyte capacity with up to four GPUs installed, uh, which has been part of the film light range for more than 10 years. Um, used onset, near set, and post houses large and small. Um, but again, as we've highlighted, with these demands for storage capacity and streaming increasing, we have developed two new configs. Um, center config there is a 720 terabyte capacity with three GPUs. And the third config, which is a 1.44 petabyte, the largest config in the range with up to two GPUs installed. So again, try to bring this into context. Um, config three is the equivalent of 400 hours of 12-bit uncompressed media at 25 frames per second. Steve was showing three different configurations of the Flux store, and we wanted to go back to uh, what was actually a, a basic configuration, a simple configuration, and just grow from there. Um, so here on this first slide, you can see that we have only one baseline system, and we could refer to it as a standalone system, um, which means that the media and cache are stored on the local storage and the baseline is hosting the database locally. This is, again, a standalone system without connection to other systems around. Here we have two baseline systems. They could be used uh, as standalone systems as well, but most facilities will want to interconnect them. One of the most common reasons to interconnect the system is to exchange projects. For example, if two different people are, a project are stored and created on the same system, and both projects need to be accessed at the same time. Uh, now we can see two base lights connected. We have different ways that you could do that, but here we chose the way that we think is the most uh, typical, which is base light A is over the network, accessing base light B local storage, and reads the media from it. Base light A local cache is still used to cache the files re read from base light B. Um, also, base light A is opening the scene stored on the base light B local database. This configuration again is working for large numbers of facilities. Um, however, we see some limitations to such pipeline. Uh, the first one is if base light B is off, then there is no media and no scene access from A. Uh, if both systems are grading at the same time, then the bandwidth of base light B would be divided between base light A and B while most of the bandwidth of base light A would still uh, be left unused. So moving to a centralized storage pipeline would solve this issue. This is where Fluxtor comes into play. Uh, Fluxtor is at the center of the pipeline. Base light A and B read media from the Fluxtor uh, shared storage, but still use their individual local storages for caching. Actually, adding a flux store to your infrastructure would allow you to use your baseline local storage only for caching. With the centralized storage, to increase storage capacity, you can increase just the one flux store. It will benefit to all the systems compared to expanding local storage of each baseline individually. Um, here we are also using a centralized database, and that database can either be a turnkey server provided by Filmlight directly, or it can be a license from Filmlight that you install on your own server. It increases the reliability and the availability of the database compared to using one of the baseline system. All the systems connect to it. And an infrastructure like this one also can easily be scaled up with, for example, a baseline conform. So baseline conform only needs to be connected to the flux store and to the database to be operational. I could also add a baseline assist, and it would be the same connection process. Now, I mentioned the centralized database earlier. 
there is actually one more way to make a database accessible on the network, and that option is a Flux Store. The so Flux Store can host the database on top of its storage unit. This option would be a benefit to any facility, but I think this is especially interesting for the smaller ones, as there is no need to use a dedicated server. Also, as you can see on the next slide, so smaller facilities might not need more user seats, but all of them have expanding storage needs as it is more and more common to see a small facility delivering UHD or HDR episodics to an OTT. Fluxstore offers a high volume of shared storage at a significantly lower rate compared to other solutions. And with the built-in ability to host a database server, it makes it even easier to deploy a centralized workflow. So far, we spoke about storage, we spoke about product sharing. Let's talk now about rendering. For a quick moment, I would like to illustrate what I consider as the two traditional ways of rendering with base light. In this situation, there is only one base light, again, a uh, standalone system. A base light system, as a reminder, is a turnkey system provided by Filmlight. It provides a user seat for control, a user seat for grading, it supports panel, and includes a renderer. That renderer will read the media from the local storage and access the scenes stored on the local database. This is referred as rendering locally. Another option is to submit render from one system to another, which is pretty common if you are already using Bezlet Conform. Bezlet Conform is a Mac OS only software with a user seat for conforming and grading. It doesn't have a panel support and it doesn't include a renderer. But you can set up a render in the render view and submit that render to the Bezlet. The Bezlet will then use the media stored locally and the scene from the local database to process that request. Now, using a Bezlet system for rendering works, but it is limiting as a system cannot be used to grade and render at the same time. Ideally, a Bezlet system should be used for supervised reading session, while other workstation would take over the rendering task. The Flux Store is helping to increase color department output as it includes a GPU resource accessible over the network. And there is another way to say it. The Flux Store can be used as a render node. I am handing over to Steve now to see how the Flux Store GPU resource is designed to improve deliveries pipeline. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Of course. Uh, so as Thomas just introduced, I'd like to move on to the most unique part of the Flux Store. It's installed GPU cards, giving anybody with the access to the baseline card a resource to render local or remote uh, media. All systems ship today from the factory with one card installed. But very importantly, the Fluxor comes with a multi-GPU license. So depending on the config, you can install up to three extra GPUs. Um, so just to kind of focus on a, on a, on a real-world example here and a little bit of a demo. So um, simply use BL Render as you do today, but with the key difference of using the GPU cards in your attached media storage device, the Flux Store, and not that baseline system. So, and, and again, as Tom introduced, you know, increasing the capacity of the suite to deliver the job without needing to stop. So whether that system be um, as an assist, a conform, a daylight workstation, you know, anything that can, any baseline system that can access the cloud can access that GPU resource of the Flux Store. So consolidation of media, uh, transcoding, uh, render deliverables, uh, it's all possible via that um, uh, GPU resource on the Flux Store. So I just want to go into a little demo here and then kind of show that BL render, that kind of the, the, the subtle differences between the two of not having a, a, an external GPU resource. So we're going to go to our timeline. So um, I have my timeline, I've uh, done my grade, I've now um, got to the point where I need to make a deliverable, but I still have my client in the suite. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the appropriate shots that I wish to render. I'm then going to go into my render panel. And this is the very kind of subtle change of um, what we're talking about here is, you know, this panel I'm sure is very familiar to everybody. I'm going to do a quick time uh, codec approval version. I'm going to make this my um, my V2, and this is the difference. So instead of 
uh, issuing that render to my queue, to my own queue on my base light, which I'll then have to stop to um, uh, process, or to another base light that might be trying to process of material as well. I'm now going to enter and uh, access my uh, external render node. I'm going to go off. I'm going to make that that, and then I'm going to submit my render. As you can see, I've now entered into my queue, um, rendering on my external render node. I'm just going to go back and check my own resource, which is fine. So at this point, I can close my render panel, I can close my uh, render queue, and I can continue to work with all of my GPUs processing uh, the, the media on my timeline with my client in the room. So, and then just to touch back onto that web UI um, and going back into this to give you a little bit more detail here. So we mentioned about the system details and the diagnostics, but now I'd like to show you that queue. So that is the queue of that render that I've just issued because I'm now logged into that system. So I can stop the queue. I can check what the queue is doing. I can then restart the queue. Um, it's just a very simple, kind of a uh, real world um, view of, of how you can change your workflows in a very simple way. So I'm just gonna log out of that. And I'm just gonna go back to my um, baseline timeline. So, and at this point, I think I'll hand back over to Toma. So Toma now is gonna illustrate this, um, showing you the render pipeline examples with a flux star. All right, well, thank you, Steve. Like I was saying, the, the baselight conform still sends uh, a render request to the baselight system. Here, the baselight conform is sending its request directly to the flux store. Um, the flux store accesses the media on its storage unit and opens a scene from its shared database. The flux store processes a request without relying on any of the workstations. And baselight A can also send a render request. Um, the flux store could even access baselight A local storage to read files from if needed. Also, baselight A could still render locally, which could help in some specific situations. The idea here is to give more options, not to limit anything in your pipeline. Um, I think it is important to say that you do not need to have several baselight to already benefit from an infrastructure. Here we have only one baselight conform and one baselight. Uh, but again, it is easy to scale up. Here I am adding a baselight assist, which is a turnkey system or a macOS software, which offers a user seat for conforming, a user seat for grading, no panel support, but it includes a renderer. And now I am adding a baselight render. So baselight render is a new product that Finlight released recently. Baselight render is a rendering tool only, and it does not have a user seat, which means that renders need to be set up on the other system on the infrastructure which will then submit the render request to the Bezat render. I will now hand over to Steve again to give us more details about this new Bezat render. So hopefully you can see that slide. Yes, we do. <laughs> Perfect. So we, um, you know, this is uh, quite an important introduction, I feel. Um, this is a client deployed, client hardware deployed render node. Um, so with, again, as Tom has just shown, and we've been introducing here, that ever increasing needs to prepare and consolidate and deliver media, um, we've decided to uh, equip you with the capabilities of being able to deploy your own hardware on a software render subscription basis. Um, so you can produce your own hard and use your own hardware as a cost-effective use of available and, and install it into your facility with support for the baseline cloud. So getting down to the detail, um, node requirements are the hardware platform is compatible with CentOS 8.1, which we're using as a base install, and equipped with one or more GPU that's supported by the NVIDIA 440 series driver. Um, you know, the minimum uh, hardware specifications are a single CPU with 24 gigabytes of RAM uh, and a single M NVIDIA GPU. Um, the recommended or the mid to high level uh, configurations will be a dual CPU with 48 gigabytes of RAM or more and two or more um, NVIDIA GPUs. Um, 
as a point of interest, the current uh, production GPU card in the factory shipping with base lights and flux stores today is an RTX 2080 Ti or the RTX um, 6000, the Quadra card. So I think you know that's a very quick introduction to the concept of that uh, client deployed um, render node, but I think it helps to introduce, um, you know, along with what we've covered earlier with the storage and rendering demands and post-production and tools, and we can help to make the workflows more cost-effective and efficient. So I think at this point, we should go to our Q&A. All right, so um, as a first thing before we go into, into the, the audience question, um, just a result of the first poll, um, so there are 60% of the people consider their storage, their storage to be almost full or full. Uh, it's like 41 less than 70, 49% said almost full, and 11% are full. And I think it's quite an interesting, uh, interesting number. Now you're gonna see uh, on your screen, uh, you're gonna see on your screen a second poll. And if you don't mind answering to those questions, and then we can also start to take some uh, questions that have been asked during the first, uh, uh, the first part of the webinar, Steve and I. Yeah, I'm just going, um, just going through the questions now, having a look. Um, can you also see those questions as well, Thomas? Is there any relating? Uh, let me see. Well, I don't have the questions myself, actually. Okay, so we've got a, a question from Ron saying about um, ASC here. Does the system allow uh, ASIS to be used? Yes, it does indeed. Our color pipeline supports the ASIS. Um, we've got another one here. Uh, can you configure the 1.5 petabyte flux with more than one GPU? Yes, indeed you can. Um, uh, the system can be configured with two GPUs. So there's a slight trade-off between uh, the storage capacity and the number of GPUs. So, uh, very basic rule of thumb there is um, larger capacity, uh, the, the fewer the GPUs. So, the smaller is four GPUs, the larger is a two. Uh, to go back quickly about the question about the ACES, I want to just clarify something. The, uh, if, the, if the question was, is ACES compatible with baselines? And yes, Steve already replied. But I just want to clarify one thing that there is absolutely no limitation with uh, the Fluxor render or the Bezat render, meaning any image you could render on a regular Bezat system would work with the Bezat render and Fluxor. So there is like no trade off on that end. Uh, I've got a, a yeah, thanks for that, Tom. I've got another question here. Um, what are the uh, current sustained bandwidth figures for each unit um, after read cache is exhausted? So. Um, we do have a pretty uh, detailed um, uh, kind of paper on the website and, the, and the, on specifically on flux stores that have all the bandwidth. But I can say the uh, the, the biggest config in the in the system there, the 1.44 petabytes, has over 10 gigabytes per second of, of raw read speed. Um, so that's another question. Uh, I've got another question here, which is mentioning about monitoring HDR UHD files. Um, yeah, baseline systems use corner cards, so we can, um, if you're talking about the, the, the physical output from the baseline in UHD, uh, at HDR uh, color spaces, then that's all possible via a corner four or corner five. Um, can I install BL render on my own hardware? Absolutely you can. That's kind of what the second section was and in, um, introducing that uh, client deployed hardware. So basically, as long as your hardware can run CentOS 8.1 and the GPU you install into that uh, system has support for the NVIDIA 440 series driver, you can run your own hardware. You just have to buy, purchase that subscription from Filmlight. So it's your hardware, our software, and uh, your purchase of the license. You can always also, uh, if you, you can, during the second part that we're going to start soon about the API, if you still want to ask questions about the Flux store, that's totally fine, and we will cover them uh, at the end of the part about the API. Um, so I've, got one, I've got one last question, Tom. Just to just to kind of answer this one, and again, I don't want to get caught up in this too much, but um, it's quite an interesting question. Is um, have you now moved to a stock CentOS for the render node, 
or base like um, UI systems as well. Um, at the moment, that's deployed in uh, base like render only, that, that CentOS. Um, but we are working on a new FLOS, which will be also based on CentOS 8. But it won't be a stock standard CentOS. That will only be available for the render node and other similar products. So, yeah. Uh, happy we've answered as many questions as we can there. If you want to um, move on, I will introduce the next section for Toma. Um, which is uh, the Filmlet API. Um, with the storage and rendering overview we've just introduced and the problems to overcome um, and the hardware and software tools to help reduce costs of infrastructure and increasing efficiency, uh, now let's take this one step further uh, and introduce uh, the Filmlet API. Over to you, Thomas. All right. Thank you, Steve. I'm going to turn off my camera now. The Filmlight API is a quite new product in the Filmlight range, right? It has been released uh, early in 2020. And API stands for Application Programming Interface. In just a few words, an API works as a control panel for developers to link different software components together. An API allows for connecting data streams and functionalities between different softwares or databases. Uh, it can be used to access and share information like metadata or to control another software. Uh, that software can be in the same product range or from a third party providers as well. By software control, I mean that instead of relying on the user interface built inside, for example, the Bezat software, I can use command line to automate tasks such as scene creation or start render and so on. Let's look at the first example right away, and I will get more into the structure later on. So, Bezlight features a tool called the Client View, which has been developed using the Filmlight API. So, from Bezlight, I will start the Client View, and will then get access to my address to go connect to it. Uh, indeed, the Client View is a web-based interface, so I'm going to first need to go log on to it. And then, as you can see here, I end up with a grid view representation of my timeline. And the concept of the client view is to allow clients to interact with a colorist during a grading session. And it can be accessed from a laptop or a tablet, really any devices on the network that have the web browser. Um, like I said, after the login, you can see here's this grid view representation. And I'm going to like press play on my timeline. You can see that every time we're going to change of shots, the shot highlighted here in the UI will change. And if I am like down into the timeline like this and I want to refocus on the shot, I can just activate the follow mode. Now, I mentioned that this uh, client view is developed using uh, the API. And this means that the API is accessing the database and extracting information. For example, here, when I click on one image, I have access to various metadata related to that specific shot. And it also works the other way around, which means I can go add information to shots. Here I can say that I want to flag the shot. And if I go into my base light, open the shot view, I'm going to get the list of all of my shots here. And if I go to the same shot here, you can now see in the client data that information we already applied here. Um, I can, it works both ways, like I was saying earlier. So if I go back onto the first shot here, you can see that I flag and the flag appears here directly. And I can add a note to say, got it, or whatever you want to say. And this information will then reappear on the other side here. And also the person using the client view, uh, need more saturation, for example. And this information will then be sent back as well. And you can, of course, remove those informations. In the shot view still, with a flag tab here, you can have access directly to all the shots that have a specific information already entered. And what I want to highlight again here is the fact that the information is accessible immediately. So the client view that ships with Bezlight now, I think is a quite good example of the kind of application that can be quite sophisticated, that can be built in-house using the Filmlight API. Now that we saw an example of what the API could be used for, I'm going to go back for a very quick moment to what an API really is. And 
I know some of you are already familiar with what concept, but I wanted to give a quick overview for those who aren't. So I'm gonna just go back on my slide for a second here. And basically APIs are used by most of us on a daily basis. And I wanted to use one of those typical real life example, like booking an airline ticket online. Um, online travel agencies platforms like Expedia, Opodo, Google Flights are websites that gives a unified access to different service providers such as car rental, airplane ticket, or hotel rooms, and still from only one website. So here I'm gonna focus on just booking an airplane ticket. And on one end, the so travel agency server, which is on the left here. Uh, the travel website is using it so the user can visualize a list of flights options with information on the days, flight, number, and so on. And those information are coming from another server, which is on the right here, the airline server. It stores all of this information. When the user confirms his or her selection, a request to book, is, to book it is sent from the travel agency server back to the airline server with the selection of the flight and the seat booked. In this whole booking process, the information has been going both ways like an exchange. And this exchange is possible because of two APIs, at least one per server, so one of each side, who act as a portal and allows the two servers to connect together. And a script will integrate both API together. To look more into a specific baseline workflow, the baseline here on the left is sending requests to the, to the Fieldlight API server here in the center. And that server can then send its own requests to the database to create a scene, for example, or to edit metadata. The Fieldlight API server can also send a request, uh, like a render request, to the baseline system here on the left. Now, on that slide, I would say two information are quite important and they are missing. First one is a language compatible with Fieldlight API. And also, what products are compatible with the API or could be used as a server? And you can find those informations here on the left regarding the languages. And on the right, you can see the compatible products. Now, regarding the product, I want to give just like an extra uh, information is you have to keep in mind that the usual license restriction applies. For example, you can connect based on conform to the API or run the API from it, but you cannot render a shot with a based conform because it's part of its uh, limitations. Um, I would say the Flux store is a good candidate to be the server as per its central role in the facility. Now that we looked at those like a uh, few slides, I want to go back into some more examples and I'm going to show you two examples. The first one will be a, a, a script that I developed to automatically create jobs and folder structure on the database and on the storage. And also the second example, which is an integration between Bezlite and Google Drive that I developed using Fimite API and the Google API. So I'm gonna just get started with the first example. Um, I mentioned a couple of times that uh, the scene creation possibilities. And here I have a script that will create a job in the Bezlite database with its internal structure of folders. I am not creating the scenes as it would involve picking a scene template or at least knowing the resolution, frame rate, and color space management. But still, because I'm always creating the same structure, I should just automate it. So here I'm gonna go into my base lights. Uh, I'm gonna go see my job manager over here. And also I'm gonna go back into my finder. I'm going to open my script that is just over here and show the storage over here. Of course, here's just like a, a local storage on my laptop, but I could just uh, put that on any other storage really. Um, and here I'm gonna so follow like a typical uh, find naming. So I'm gonna put like a, a one, two, three for the ID and then say that was for a commercial. So this is the name of my specific uh, project. And I'm going to press enter and we can see here that of course the folder has been created and here we have different subfolders for my template, but also some folders include some folders themselves. So this is like a typical template that you could use. It's not the template, but one of them that you could use to organize your own project. And also if I go into my Bezlad here, my job manager, and I refresh here, you can see now that I have this new job created over here, and also a folder structure have already been created for me. So it's all again the idea with the API. So you, as much as you can automate so you don't redo the same operation again and again and again, the more time you save,
but it's also about making sure that the same task is repeated in the exact same way, meaning, meaning you are minimizing the, norm, the number of potential uh, user uh, error. Now, I'm going to go to uh, a bit more like what is underneath all of this. Uh, when you are developing for the one used to develop integrations or working with like Python, for example, uh, you are going to use different classes of code. And here is a list on your screen of all the different classes that are being shipped with Bezlite API at the moment. Now, the API is built directly from the current database, from the current daylight and Bezlite code base. So it is in constant synchronization with these products and new classes will be added later on. Um, so I will not cover the detail of the code, but I wanted to give you an overview of the structure underneath the scene creation script that I just used. So here I'm highlighting the two classes that I've been using, so job manager and scene. And you can see here a specific focus on just a job manager class, and I'm now highlighting the different methods that I've been using from that method. Now, I'm going to go back now to another example, and again, I will show after how I have been uh, working on that. Um, before that, I just want to give a, a quick heads up about something. Uh, the script, as you can imagine, was fairly simple to create the project in the folder, but uh, it requires specific experience of coding and knowledge of Bezlite to integrate the API. Um, to me, it's not something that you want to develop quickly between two grading sessions, because even if a script has only 50 lines of code, it needs to be robust and well tested before going into production. Because even from my experience, again, a short code, a, a, a code can be short, but it can also provide important services to a facility. Um, and this is even more accurate on my third and last example, which is the integration I made between Bezlite and a third party service, which here is Google Drive and Google Sheets. So I will show that example to you right now and then get back a bit later on on how I developed it. Um, to get started on that, I'm going to just go back on Bezlite now, go back to my old shots. And as you can see here in the shot view, of course, this is where you're going to find the list of your shot and all of the metadata. Now, I've been uh, wondering how do you give access to those information to as many people as possible still in a way that is user friendly and a way that is uh, secure. Uh, because I noticed in a typical pipeline, the people who would want to get this information, um, the problem is they need to go on a business system. So that means they need to be trained enough. And also it means that you need to have a machine that is available and allocated for that specific task. So if you can extract the information from that scene, from the database, which the API allows to do, and show this information elsewhere, that could be a benefit. So I've been looking at what could be the right platform to do that. And a lot of facilities I know are now using uh, Google Sheets, Google Drive, Google Docs, and Gmail as their, um, as their tool for sharing documents online in their emails. So I was thinking maybe with the API of Google, I can actually recreate a mini shot view inside a Google Doc. And this is what I'm going to show you today. Of course, I, could, I use Google Drive. I could have used something else as long as it has an API to do that. So I'm going to just get started by going here. I'm going to close that one. Go into my shot here. So it's like a Google, a Google uh, spreadsheet. And I want the user interface to be as simple as possible. So here I'm going to just click on Update Now. And this is going to automatically, in the background, access my scene and extract the metadata and go display all of those metadata over here. And as you can see, we have the same information as we had on the shot view. And this is extremely dynamic, right? Meaning if I go into my comment section over there and I say like, this is test 01, and this is test 02, and I save the scene. And now I go back into here, the, the, my web page, and I update it again. You will now see that after a few seconds, once the update is complete, the information are now shown here. Um, and it works both ways. By default here, we are in read only, meaning that if I go select like all those information and just erase and nothing is going on on the database. Um, if I would want to go modify information, what I would need to do is first make sure the scene is closed because I'm gonna need read and write access to that scene. And then here I'm gonna move from the read only mode to read and write. And when I do, that's going to take a couple of seconds. And you can see here, we are now with a red logo in read and write mode. 
And underneath here, we now have a new flag on the different columns. If the column is green, it means you can edit the metadata. For example, here I can go keep going on that very original uh, test pattern and just like add a few tests here. Or I could say, well, circle take it, just make it on yes to everything. So we have something very visible. Um, another thing I could go modify at the end here is typical the scene and take, which the IT have to enter, like using daylight, for example. So here I could say, well, this is A03 for a few take. And then from that, I'm going to just go one, two, three. You can just enter this information pretty quickly because, again, it's just a regular spreadsheet. But also, you notice some columns are in red, and those columns are the ones that you cannot modify um, because those type of metadata cannot be modified on Vezla. Like, it's not because you would replace OpenEXI by ProRes that you're going to actually change the media type of the file that the database is reading. So this is why some columns are in red, and I also added a node to say that this column is actually just read only. And from there, I can save to write the information back into the baseline scene. Here's a green flag confirms that it has been saved successfully. And when I go back here into my baseline timeline, I'm going to reopen it. And if I go now here, you can see that in my scene and take, we now have extra information. I will also notice that all of the circle takes are now on yes, and I expanded my test comments over here. So again, the information are going both ways. Um, in Bezat, you have a way to export CSV files, which is very convenient to send metadata to other software. This is something accessible also directly from here. Um, when I select Get CSV, it's going to go access the database, generate the CSV. And then the question is, I'm using this Google page. Uh, I could use it from a computer at the office, but what if I'm actually working remotely? Where is that file generated? Where is it going to go? Because it, I might be working remotely, but I don't want to have an access to a specific like uh, a server. So if you go just into the Google Drive, uh, here we can see, so like 1.51 PM, so exactly like right now. So my files doc, uh, folder just got created. I go inside and I have access to my CSV. And here now I have the CSV files is already available for downloading or sharing and so on. Um, so I made it so it's automatically update, uh, upload for you, so it's immediately um, available. The last uh, thing I'm going to show you about this integration here is about rendering. When I'm going inside of the base light and I open my scene, uh, I'm going into my render page here. I think nothing new here. You're going to find some presets for rendering. I have four at the moment, EXR graded in Rec 1886, one EXR ungraded for working color space, and so on. So each of those already have a specific setup in them, specific settings about how they're going to be rendered and where. Um, I'm going to like, close my scene for now. I'm going to go back here into the, uh, the shot part here. And as you can see, we have a drop down menu column here with render templates. When I go select one of them here, I'm going to have the same renders as the one I have uh, from my scene. And this is because I just grab those render templates and I, I am displaying them here in this drop down menu. I go back to my scene, remove one of them, or add one of them. This will be up updated here at the same time. The next time I would be clicking on update now. The reason I implemented it that way is because if you want to start two different renders applied to two different groups of shots, then Having a view like this is very convenient. I'm going to take the first shot here and say, well, that one I want to export an EXR ungraded because I want, let's say, to take it to uh, VFX. The first render template applied to the first group, which is only one shot, but still a group of shots. I'm going here and I'm going to say, I want those to be ProRes. And I want it for the first file here and the second, and let's say a third. So now I have two render templates applied to two different group of shots. Here, I'm going to select what base light I want to send the request to. Is there either base light one or render one? In my case, I'm going to just stick to base light one. And I'm going to click on render now. Um, as you can see on the left here, we now have a new column. And what's going on is because you don't have necessarily access to the queue monitor, you want to see the progress of the render. I have built in a progress bar that is here showing me uh, how the render is doing. And if I go here inside of my render, you can see that for the progress, so it's, it's following the deliveries uh, that I already set up. 
um, the first render is almost complete. And once it is marked as completed, then it's going to go into the next render. So it's also something very, uh, from my experience, uh, useful is now I can just select different groups and apply different templates and still submit only the render once. So I can save a lot of time as, as an assistant when I have to export a lot of different shards. And now both renders have been completed. So render templates are reset to none and the column has been removed. So this is integration that I made between Google Drives and, um, and Google Sheets and also the Shemite API. And I'm going to just highlight here for the example the different classes that I've been using here as a quick uh, overview. Now, I just want to comment that here, the several aspects that I have to take in consideration where, you know, picking the platform to display the information, uh, platform for the UI, how to manage read and write access, how to give access to the CSV file and so on. And from my uh, my perspective as a, as a consultant, when I integrate API for facilities, I found, you know, like analyzing the workflow with the team, discussing with the facility, what could be automated and imagine what the tool could look like. All this is extremely important. And it takes almost more time to imagine what the tool could be, uh, to write a framework document, to support the development and to test the tool compared to actually developing it. So as a conclusion for my part, I see like uh, FLAPI is an incredible opportunity to integrate pipelines with or without the new products that we showed you today um, to make information exchange more reliable and simply to make the day-to-day -day life in post facilities um, easier. So I think now is a good time to take a couple of questions before concluding for today. Um, so we are going to cover some of the questions you have asked during the webinar. And you can also contact us directly if you have additional questions. I will leave our contact details on. Uh, but first, we will ask you one last question so the poll can keep going while we answer with Steve some on, of the question. And that question, that last poll is about the API uh, integration. Uh, first question that I have here, uh, can the API be used to automate transcode pipelines through baseline render? And can we create conditions for the transcode if it's a certain resolution, use different format settings? So yes, baseline render can be used as any other baselight, like Assist, uh, Flux Store, uh, baselight as uh, a workstation can be used. So when you submit the render, you will just specify. Um, it's actually something that I was uh, showing here. I mean, you don't see it on my screen, but I had a drop down menu on my screen to go select what system to send it to. Um, can we create condition for the transcode if it's a certain resolution? Um, I mean, if you, you could do a lot of different, I'm not sure what you mean exactly. Um, you we don't, in Bezlight, you have a tool called the Media Import Rule, and this is not implemented as far as I know yet inside of the API, so you cannot use that, but because you can access uh, specific information about, uh, about the shot, you could say, well, if the shot is matching that resolution, then start that render, yes. Um, Another question is, uh, what are the limitations of the API presently? What can I, uh, what can I not do that a Bezat UI user can? Um, when I was showing the classes earlier, you could see that some, I mean, you have to read between the lines, you can see what is there and then what is not there. Um, so I would say that if you do, when you get access to the documentation of the API, that is actually extremely well done, uh, you will be able to see what is in there, what is missing. And the API has a full team of developers behind. So anytime you have a feedback, you can send it to development or to support. And this will then be uh, going into, um, into future feature requests. And about the published list of current classes and instances, all of this is available. So if you go into your, uh, I'm not sure if we could close the poll, then people would be able to see my screen share again. But when you go like on a Mac, for example, here inside of, uh, of, uh, of Bezlight, then you can go see uh, inside a folder, you can have access to the, uh, you, uh, to the documents, Flappy, and here you have one for each uh, of, the, of the documentation. And inside of this, uh, you're gonna be able to have access to all of the information. Um, uh, then another question here uh, that I'm just discovering right now. So I think I'm seeing two questions that have to do with Flux Store and media management. So maybe you could cover those, Steve, if you are, if you are here. Uh, 
Uh, it, could you read them out there? Because I, I think the question is now going to you. So there's a question, but can you use a flux store as a cache for Bezlite? No, no, no. The uh, cache is always local to the Bezlite systems. Um, so in effect, your your <coughs> raw material or your um, uh, source media is always on the flux store or the subsequent render, but the cache is always local to the Bezlite system. And there is another question is, um, what uh, would you say if the media is already in the cloud, like for example, on a, a AWS S3, uh, how would you, what could we do about that? How do you access those in the Bezlite ecosystem? Uh, it, it, it really does depend how the access is, is given to the Bezlite system itself. So, um, you know, for instance, a lot of people are running in the larger facilities are running like a hybrid clustered system. So part of it is in the cloud and part of it is uh, actually physically in their facility. But that is presented to the baseline via the native driver. So that is then mounted like any other mount. So most of the cloud resource we access, baseline uh, just sees it as another mount. And uh, it's all down to how that is presented within your facility to the baseline cloud. Um, it's quite a complicated topic. <laughs> And uh, we could definitely go into it, but um, I think that's probably better over email or a one-to-one or -one, uh, than doing it here. And we'll just take a, one last question quickly. There was a question you know, I, I just showed how to access documentation for, for Bezlite. And the question is, do you have an, uh, an API documentation for Daylight as well? Yes, on your Mac, it would be located in the same folder. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so it's something, it works in both ways. You just have some... Um, again, to keep in mind what are the limitations of each software that you are that you are using. Well, I think that that that's it on my end. I don't know if you wanted to add anything else, Steve, or no. Apart from uh, apologizing about the unknown technical glitch that I was completely oblivious to. <laughs> yeah, it's totally your fault. You know, like you managed completely your internet connection, right? No, exactly. it has been. A... Quite, I'm, quite a challenge. I'm embarrassed about my own internal network not um, uh, keeping up with the demands of post production. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, that's it for today then. And we will send out a short survey afterwards as well. And we would really appreciate if you could send your feedback. And also, I would like to thank everybody who have been involved in preparing the webinar because of always, like you see, only two persons here, but it's actually. A lot of people just simply to like get the questions to us, but also like all the practice round before and all the different feedbacks we got during the preparation. So thank you very much. And once again, feel free to get in touch if you would like to. Yeah, thanks very much. All right, bye. Bye.